Hello and good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Online. We're all the way from Evenwood in the southwest of County Durham. And it's, it's fantastic that you can join us today, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. It's great to spend this time together. Now, for the next couple of weeks, um, for Cornerstone Online, it's going to look slightly different to how it's looked for the past many months. Um, because I'm away on holiday and Pastor Sandy's going away and various people in the church are going to be on holiday here and there. We thought that we would do something, just a slimmed down version of what we are doing online. So this week and next week, it'll be a, a bit of a shorter version of what we're going to do. So we will have a short time of worship together. We will have God's word preached which is, is one of the most important things because God's word touches hearts and changes lives. And in it, in this time that we're going to share together, although it might be different to how we've done things before, you know, we keep saying that God's doing something different. Well, for the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing something different. But through it all, we pray and hope that God will touch your heart, that you will know God's blessing, that you will know God's voice, into speaking into your situation that you will know the reality of God's presence with you and you will know his abundant life because that's why Jesus came to not to the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy but Jesus came that we might have life and life to the full life more abundantly so we pray that you will know that life today as we worship together and as we hear God's word Pastor Sandy's going to preach later on about the dynamics of change the third part of the dynamics of change in our hearts, individually and as a church. So be blessed this morning. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.
Good morning. In recent weeks, I have spoken uh, about the dynamics of change, and I want to continue on that theme today. To do that, I'm going to read some more from Acts chapter 9, from verse 10 through to verse 19. Acts 10, sorry, Acts 9, starting to read at verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard much from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from your chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptised. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Let's pray. Father, concerning your word, Make it as real to us today as it was the day that it was written. Speak to us clearly so that we might understand the things of your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. In this short series on dynamics of change, I have previously spoken about laying aside our plans when God brings about change and some things have to stop to allow things to begin. Not short and snappy titles, but a summation of the things that we've spoken of. Today, I want us to see God sometimes does things in ways which we do not comprehend. Things in ways that we don't understand even how they could be of God. Let's start by looking at the man in our scripture reading, the man Ananias. It's most likely that Ananias was Jewish, and we can say that because at that time not many Gentiles had been evangelized, not many who were outside Judaism had become followers of Jesus. And indeed, that was what Saul of Tarsus would go on to do. So it's most likely, most probable, that Ananias was a Jewish man. Every person who believed that Jesus was the Messiah would have known about this Saul and of how much of a threat he was. From the beginning of Acts 9, we see that Saul had the favour of the Sanhedrin of the ruling Jewish council and he was given authority to persecute and imprison the followers of Jesus as we saw before he was the one who stood by when Stephen was martyred. Saul represented a very serious threat to those that were in the way, to those that were the followers of Jesus. And if God had not stopped him when he did, not stopped him in his tracks, then many more might have died. 
I think I can confidently say that Ananias's natural inclination would have been to avoid Saul of Tarsus at all costs. In verses 11 and 12, the Lord tells Ananias what he wants him to do. And in verses 13 and 14, we see his very measured response. Let me read those verses again. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. I cannot think but help. No, I cannot help but think <laughs> that if the Lord had asked me to do that, it would have brought out my inner Jonah. You want me to go where, Lord? You want me to see who? You want me to do what? It's difficult for us in this nation and at this time to comprehend just how much of a threat Saul posed to believers because we live in a society where no one has that kind of social, legal, religious power. Though we do know that there are nations around this world where believers are at risk of persecution, at risk of imprisonment, at risk even of death. If this had not been God at work, then Ananias could very well have found his life in danger. Going to see Saul would be a bit like Daniel volunteering to go into the lion's den, or like his three companions, Mishael, Hananiah and Azariah, we more commonly refer to them as Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, but Mishael, Hananiah and Azariah are their Hebrew names. It would be a bit like these three men asking to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Daniel emerged unscathed from the lion's den and his companions came out of the furnace without as much as a burnt hair or even the smell of smoke. And that was only made possible because God was with them and kept them safe in the most difficult of circumstances. If Ananias had been operating on earthly wisdom alone, he would never have gone to see Saul. But Ananias was answering a higher call. Scripture tells us that it was Jesus that he was answering to. For Ananias to approach Saul with any hope of success, he had to be absolutely certain that the instruction came from God. If we believe that God, if you believe that God wants you to do something, particularly something different or unusual, then we have to be as certain as we can that it's God who's speaking to us before we start out. We have to be sure that it's not the enemy whispering in our ear because he wants to divert us or to harm us. And we have to be sure that it's not just our own strong desire sending us off on a false errand. How many of us have been down that road? If the thing that you are dreaming of the thing that you are expecting, hoping, planning for, is a bit out of the box, then there are three things to do. Firstly, keep on praying about it. God does not change his mind, and his position will be consistent throughout. God doesn't say, go over here. No, 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 hang on, go over there. God does not change his mind in that way. Secondly, does it in any way, the thing that you are thinking of, does it in any way contradict scripture? Because if it does, then forget it. God doesn't change his mind. What he's written in his word is the same thing that he would say. 
And thirdly, a wise thing to do is to bring it before a trusted Christian friend, possibly the church oversight. And then you might find help in discerning whether it really is God's will or not. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 22 says, Without counsel plans go awry, but in the multitude of counsellors they are established. When Ananias went to Judas' house on Straight Street, he would have been met not by Saul, but by Judas or, or by a member of his household. And there, in that moment, would have been the confirmation that Ananias needed. Yes, Saul is here. Yes, he has lost his sight. Yes, he has met with Jesus in a dramatic way. And yes, he is expecting you. Although Ananias had to be obedient to God's call, as soon as he stepped out, all the pieces would have fallen into place. Now, today, I'm not going to even try to give you an example of what kind of different thing God might do in your life or do in our midst. And I'm not going to do that for two reasons. Firstly, I don't want to sow any ideas in anyone's mind. And secondly, our God is more than capable of revealing any new or unusual plans that he has to whoever he wants to be involved. Anything we might suggest or imagine will pale in comparison to God's almighty plan. Having said that, and I'm not going to sow any ideas, there will be times when words come from this platform, words come from elsewhere, that speak into a situation that you are considering. And when these things happen, it is a confirmation, or it can be a confirmation, that we're heading off in the right direction. Ananias needed both conviction and courage to approach the dreaded Saul of Tarsus. But God won't always call us to do heroic or challenging things. And here I think of Naaman, the commander of the army of Syria, who was, as we read in 2 Kings chapter 5, an honourable man and a leper. After some toing and froing, Naaman came to Elisha, the prophet of Israel, seeking to be cured from his leprosy. The task that he was given was not pleasing to him. It wasn't pleasing for a couple of reasons. First of all, because Naaman, having made the journey, at least expected Elisha to come and talk to him and not just send a servant. But secondly, it was the task itself that put Naaman off. Naaman wasn't disconcerted by the enormity of the task that he was given, but he was upset at just how meagre it was. Naaman thought he'd have to do something mighty to accomplish such a work of healing. But when the answer was, go and take a bath, or, or, or more accurately, go and bathe seven times in the Jordan River, he got upset and would have walked away if his servants hadn't persuaded him. Naaman went, he bathed, and he was healed, just as the man of God said. So today from Ananias and Naaman, we learn that sometimes God uses the most unusual events and circumstances to accomplish extraordinary things. And his great works are not finished yet. Don't be afraid of change that God has ordained, for his ways are higher and his plans are greater than anything we might imagine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 we read, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, 
nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. When unknown or unusual events happen, when we believe that we are being led to do something that is different, go first to God, for when we do, he will make his plans clear. Lord, fill us with your wisdom and create in us a rising expectation that you will in unusual ways use us to do great things that will glorify your precious name. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, in every way, in every circumstance, when new or unusual things come our way, help us to understand that they may be of you. But Lord, give us your wisdom and discernment to know that which is yours and that which is just diversionary. Speak to us clearly and accomplish that that you want to do in our lives today and every day. Amen. And we come now to a time of breaking bread together and of prayer. So we're going to pray first and if you would like to go and prepare the bread and cup then now would be a good time to pause and, and go and do that. But we're going to pray together. We're going to think of that, those verses in Philippians 4, 6-7. Again, we share these many, many times. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we do pray. We pray for those who are anxious. We pray for those who, who need your peace. That, Lord, as they reach out to you, you will fill them with your peace to overflowing. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that we can't even understand. But Lord, we pray that they would know your peace. They would know your presence in their lives. For those who are learn lonely, for those who are hurting, that Lord, they would know your rebuilding. They would know your, your touch of, of, of healing in their lives. And Lord, we pray for our families and friends. Lord, those who, who know you and those who may be afar off, we pray for each one. As, as we pray together, we, we lift up the names of the people who we're thinking about. And Lord, we ask you to come and move by your power. Come and speak to hearts, speak to lives, change hearts, change lives. And Lord, draw people to yourself. Help us to be your hands and feet, to be your mouthpiece, to do and say the right things that would help people be drawn to you. And we join together as we say the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us himself. The words will be on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we do come now and we break bread together. We say thank you for for the, the great sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us. We say thank you for his love that he poured out on us from the cross, for his grace that we didn't deserve, for the mercy that he shows in our lives. And we read the words from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
and in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and we are forever thankful forever thankful for for his love for us for his sacrifice that Jesus made as we continue with our service this morning Oh 